The strange waves came back a few moments later as the seals were scrambling onto the leaking raft for safety as the biggest wave yet hit them. Seals in every direction, and then I saw them. Huge killer whales with mouths open, waiting for the seals to land from the launch. The seals were as big as maybe 400 pounds or more, and the killer whales were several, several tons in comparison. My friends started coming out as the surgeon needed some room to work. As the door swung a few times, I saw a transparent Esther turning to look at me and then back to her dad as he was being operated on, his hand trying to reach out for her hand in his semi-conscious state. We all sat in awe for the next hour as the killer whales one by one dismantled every raft full of mutant seals alternating which made the waves and which waited with their mouths open to catch them. The last to go were the 25 or so footers and the 50 footer ship we thought was the ops ship. The people in it had long since tried to swim out and were eaten by the mutant seals. The seals were the last to be eaten by the killer whales. The beautiful black and white spotted killer whales kept whooshing wave after wave onto the biggest boat until it finally went down. The seals spilling out easy snacks for the killer whales. The last we saw of the ships were their telltale flags at the end of the flagpoles, representing the enemy force we'd been dealing with for years. Chapter 16. A New Clam. Late Morning. Day 2. The whales splashed and played for an hour after that, enjoying the victory with us. The seagulls tried to pick scraps off the water, only to also get eaten by the killer whales. Our ships finished getting fueled up and we were able to move it out of the way. We put it on the other side so the ships that needed to could fuel up. A few guys got on the ship and scrubbed it down good as XPX rested up from his successful surgery. Every time I looked at the ship, I felt the presence looking at me, upset and distraught, like I'd better be taking care of their loved one. XPX was doing well, though, as long as he didn't move too much. For a while, he was going to make a full recovery. We got him back to the patrol vessel into his captain's quarters, and he peacefully fell right to sleep. One of our medics stayed with him to make sure he would have constant care. I felt a whoosh of calm through me as if everything was okay again. I smiled and saw that XPX, with his eyes closed to sleep, smiled. As that was happening, a new set of ships started over the horizon from the east. We hadn't really planned what to do if this happened. When they calmed in, it turned out to be our puddle jumper team coming to give us backup since we were supposed to have been back several hours ago. They explained they had to wait until the storm slowed down, but came as fast as they could. Once they docked, they got fueled up as well. We took the guys that wanted to go back and we all went back to shore together. We left the puddle jumper with the oil rig so they didn't feel stranded anymore. It wasn't as big as our patrol boat, but it was very fast, burned a lot of fuel, and didn't have a big fuel capacity. When we were back, we got everyone back up to speed and negotiated who would want to come back out and where everyone's loved ones were. The oil tanker was docked, but it seemed to be busy filling up other ships. It seemed that the oil wasn't really being distributed at all, and it was going straight to the bad guys. The tribe's folk filled up a couple tankers for themselves that they said was going to their farm equipment. We filled a couple too to send in multiple directions to where the farms were. One northwest, one northeast, and one southeast. They would all have the highway patrol with them, which were currently waiting at the refinery. There were all sorts of engineers and mechanics at the refinery getting it to work. We needed to do that so the vehicle engines would run properly. Ships and farm equipment, the process wasn't as important, but it was for normal vehicles due to different engines. Chapter 7, New Beginnings, Midday, Day 2. As the fuel got properly refined, the motorcycles all filled up and filled up spare tanks. Then three semis rolled out each with their own contingent of the new highway guards. No attacks ever came to our strongholds. Nobody had any fuel to come get us. All of the fuel that each of the city-states had been hoarding for an attack got sabotaged. The damage wouldn't be readily obvious, though. A substance was put into all the fuel tanks that, upon starting the engines, would cycle the altered fuel and ruin the vehicles. They would all break down within about five minutes of driving. The fuel trucks had been stolen. 
stripped of their tracking devices and repurposed for patriotic fuel deliveries. It turned out the refinery only needed to get turned back on. The EPA had shut it down for no reason other than to funnel petrol refinement through other facilities. Those facilities and pipelines, of course, ironically got destroyed by the other side a long time ago. The engineers were all still in the area and got each other trained up and running the facility very well. They kept a lot of people busy and out of trouble. They had yet another success to be very proud of. With this system we developed, the area could have our farm equipment up within a few weeks and finally started making our own food at industrial and commercial speeds again. We would go back to having a food surplus. There'd be food in everyone's homes. People would flock back to the farms to work. Nobody getting taxed to death while the money gets absorbed into frivolous pet projects and backdoor campaign lobby reimbursements. Chapter 18, The Coming Weeks. XPX made a full recovery as expected and went back to commanding the Esther patrol ship. The rest of the fleet slowly rotated through the oil rig and got fuel, got fuel back up. It wasn't long before our navy was back up to full capacity and able to fully patrol and defend significant portions of the Pacific Northwest Harbor. We got a ferry up and running which restored connections to the major islands. We were able to manage one trip back and forth to each per week. We weren't political with who got to use it, but kept it very safe for everyone as well. Everyone that used it ended up being extremely self-policing. The routes that fueled vehicles were used more for trade than anything. The islands had done okay with being self-sustaining, but still needed some raw materials they didn't have, so that worked out well. There had been some military folks holed up at one of the islands that nobody ever came and rescued. They had been keeping the island safe from pirates as well as anyone on the island who tried to disrupt law and order. They ended up being the law enforcement for the islands if they wanted to. Most of them liked that very much. A few dissolved and went to go try and find their families, which everyone understood. A few of them started a second group out of Bremerton, which became another main naval hub for the area. They gathered all the engineers and mechanics that wanted something to do and began repairing all the ships they could find. In time, it would become a premier, premier naval shipyard. It wasn't long before the warm embrace of summer began. The ground was ready and every heirloom seed that everyone could find or harvest was ready. The biggest crop of food the Pacific Northwest had ever seen started to grow. Then one day, just as fast as it stopped, the stupid electricity turned back on. That same day, I came back into my tiny home after teaching the little kitties. Out of nowhere, there was hanging on my doorknob my old bicycle helmet. It had a thank you note. Thanks for everything you do. Keep it up. I heard a familiar and absolutely gigantic engine ripping off into the, di the distance. A big grin filled my face. Chapter 19, The Coming Months. Home stronghold two years and six months after the collapse, spring. I guess my cat decided it was time, time to get up. Time to get up because she was walking all over my tender ribs again. My back was sore, I guess sleeping on my tummy again, but I had to get up and get the cat off me. It was time to get ready. They ended up making me a full-time teacher now in our stronghold. I made my own lesson plans and all of my own teaching documentation. I spent a small but important portion of the day teaching kids something new, something that hadn't been done in a long time. I taught them how to learn. We went over the basics in history, but it wasn't revisionist history, it was actual history. The good and the bad, it wasn't shoehorned into a narrative, it wasn't romantically intertwined with amusing anecdotes that people wouldn't have recognized for ages after the fact as relevant. It was actual history, so it wouldn't be repeated. The kids got plenty of breaks, and it helped their brains soak in the important lessons. They didn't have any homework, so they would get maximum family time. Electricity was never taken for granted again, and the internet was rarely used. The TVs were never used again for hundreds of pointless and useless channels. The only sports that anyone paid attention to were the local ones that the kids played. There were no more participation trophies. You either won or you lost, then had to discover what losing actually meant. If a young couple was dating and the girl dumped the boy, he had to handle himself, or there were swift consequences. You had to figure out adversity and how to overcome it. You were taught to look for niches where your services were needed, then how to fairly work that niche so you didn't royally screw everyone. 
There were no more patent trolls sitting on copyrights and trademarks for ages that didn't further advance society. There was no more frivolous lawsuits from companies that never produced anything. There were no more malpractice lawsuits jacking up healthcare prices vicariously through insurance premiums. We completely ignored life-saving medications if the rest of the world didn't want to work with us fairly. We didn't do this to prematurely die. We did it because we were finally emotionally and physically in control of ourselves. We were living life to the fullest and coming to terms with reality. Nobody stayed on life support for ages anymore, draining the system and everyone's finances. If it was your time to go, you got to decide that. On that point, everyone started keeping their babies again. Lots of them were needed to work the land in positive functioning parts of society. The pregnancies were planned and everyone was well taken care of.